Hello, good evening. Firstly, let me wish everyone a happy International Women's Day. Hi. Hi, Jen. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Tina? I'm not bad. It's early morning here in the well, early morning. It's ten o'clock, mid morning, <laughs> um, and yeah, we all the parents in the UK are now a little bit relieved because the children have gone back to school, which has been an eight long weeks of homeschooling. So, I just want to say a big woohoo to all the parents and well done. <laughs> yeah, well done. We made it. We made it. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> yeah. I think in, India is still not there. Mm. we just opened up some of the schools and they're slowly taking in uh, kids mm. so it's still difficult on parents like i have my neighbors i hope they're not watching this video the kids are always <laughs> screaming <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah that's what kids do <laughs> they <Yeah>. scream <laughs> <laughs> i swear <laughs> so firstly happy women's day tina thank you very much thank you you're doing a wonderful job in the area of uh, maternal uh, mental health for uh, south asian women right if i'm not wrong yes yeah can you tell me more about it what do you do well so by background by training i'm a clinical psychologist so um i trained in the uk and what i found was that there's great you know spaces for mental health awareness it's becoming a, a huge conversation in the uk but what we realized very quickly was that there's not space for conversation around <laughs> cultural nuances and the differences and the difficulties that we experience within south asian communities um and i felt like that this was an a big issue really in terms of a addressing this community's needs but also then starting to think about how do we um bridge that gap between what services can offer and um you know how how people like myself would access these services so there's lots of gaps here and we've been talking about you know mental health and race for for years you know 15 20 years it's been a topic of conversation but i think the problem is that there's just so much work to do within the uk in particular and we've been hugely inspired by the work done in the us following george floyd and all of the stuff that's happened over there with the black lives matter movement there's been this sort of um ripple effect across the pond into the UK where we're starting to really talk about how race matters and race and racism actually is a problem within the UK and as i sort of started to talk about these issues within um my social media platform it became hugely apparent that you know people within india were also talking about the same issues but not so much from a racism angle but from an angle of that South Asian women actually experience high levels of psychological distress and these are actually caused and perpetuated by cultural factors. You know, the fact that actually, you know, on women's day we're we're celebrating women. You know, within Hinduism our goddesses are celebrated and actually when we think about how we treat women within the South Asian culture there's this huge gap of, you know, how is it look like in practice but then how are we you know praying to our goddesses this is a huge huge difference here we say one thing but we do another so for me this is a big big issue and i you know because you know the whole area of women's mental health is so huge it starts from what the things we start to say to our daughters the things we start to say to our sons and there are amazing groups and platforms out there that are starting to talk about you know patriarchy gender equality there are platforms where we're starting to address things from a micro level like we've got the pink ladoo project which is international um started off by um somebody who felt passionate about gender equality from the moment that we start to give out our mitya you know from the point that small act is so important the fact that you know i don't know in in your community but in our community certainly when girls are born we we give out jalebi and when boys are born it's um benda 
And actually there's a difference there. And actually there's a meaning, significant difference. So all these small movements are adding up. And, you know, we need to start to have these joined up conversations around, okay, all this stuff is happening out here. Now, how is this affecting women's mental health? How is this affecting, you know, young women growing up? And, you know, we've seen within the UK in particular, this sort of issue around how growing up with the conflict of two different cultures has really caused a lot of psychological distress in women. Back in the um, late 70s, early 80s and 90s, there was um, parts of research that was done that showed that actually South Asian women were the high, you know, we're talking, we're expressing the highest levels of depression um, and suicide attempts, you know, across all communities. And, and this was a really significant proportion of women. And, you know, a lot of researchers were confused as to what, what's going on here. And when we start to ask women these questions, they talk about this feeling of being conflicted, you know, one minute they are Indian, the next minute they leave the house and they have to become very westernized. And the conflict and the challenges that raises, fast forward 20, 30 years on, the problem still prevails. It's still a problem. You know, women are still being forced, you know, to almost choose what they are, but they're having to constantly switch between, you know, not being Indian enough or not being English, English enough or British enough. So this is causing a lot of, problems for South Asian women, particularly in the UK and, and out in the diaspora. But I know from kind of reaching out to people um, within India that there is a movement, there is a rise where they're challenging patriarchy, they're challenging these sort of ideas of what women should be. And we are now starting to co-create what it looks like to be a woman and initiatives like International Women's Day is that perfect platform to have these conversations. So thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, I always wondered, Tina, that um, because India is a developing country, mm. um, probably mental health is underrepresented in this country, whereas um, probably UK or other countries, I'm sure mental health is doing phenomenally well. But talking to people like you and there are a couple of other people that I was talking to, it's, it's unfortunate that it still is underrepresented uh, in any part of the world. Well, re relatively, some places are doing better than others. Um, but I think what we need is awareness. Um, I want to give you a simple example, right? I saw this patient today. Um, I think 48-year-old um, woman was brought to me with uh, symptoms of uh, clinical depression and anxiety. And I was talking to the patient and um, I asked husband, can you wait out for some time? He's looking at his wife and he, he's not letting her speak. And he's saying that um, he's only talking about physical symptoms. He's saying that, oh, she's not able to sleep and uh, she has headaches. And when I say, how is your mood? He He's answering, uh, saying that, oh, her mood is great. She doesn't have any work. She just has to stay at home and take care of, uh, you know, household activities. I'm the one who goes out and earns money and comes home. So I have stress. She doesn't have any stress. So I asked him, uh, sir, can you please step out for a while? I would like to talk to her. And then she told me, like, um, she's never been happy. She's 48. And she said she's never been happy. Uh, it, it, it just broke my heart that, but, but again, like, it's not this one patient. This is like an everyday story for me where um, some of them don't open up. Uh, some of them start, like, they have a catharsis. Uh, what is it like in UK? I mean... <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you. It's not too, it's not too, you know, it's not too dissimilar. Um, I think what's happening here in the UK is that the younger generation are really speaking out. And, you know, I'm kind of like the in-between generation. I was born here, but I grew up with not really understanding what mental health issues were. I had to figure out them myself. And there wasn't really a platform like social media, which has allowed myself or people in my generation to really express what it means. It was done within the privacy of my clinic office. You know, we talk about mental health and, you know, it, that was it. But fast forward now to 2020 or 2019 or where, when, whenever this sort of revolution started, where we started being honest about the struggles. We started to all say, you know what, I too feel the pressure of 
I don't know, needing to um, please my parents to study whatever degree that I needed to study in order to make them happy. And it's, it's that same narrative, isn't it? It's that same narrative of the pressure that we feel to conform to what society expects of us. A bit similar to your patient, you know, that you saw this morning, that she probably felt a lot of pressure to conform to what society is expecting of her to be this woman or this wife or this mother, whatever she is. And, you know, within the UK, it's, it's, it's again, very, very new in terms of challenging what does motherhood look like? And, you know, this has come from predominantly a white middle class lens that we've seen this shift. And now we're seeing, you know, black mothers talk about it, South Asian mothers talking about it, that actually we are unhappy and we be different. And we want um, it to be different for any other woman that comes into this space. So we aren't, we aren't, you know, to two different kind of countries experiencing very different um, sort of expressions of mental health. I think they are the same. Um, I think the difference is that the younger generation are pushing forward with educating themselves. They are very much in tune with the language that we're offering them and they are challenging it. Whereas anybody in sort of my generation and above are struggling with it and have had to push down all these feelings, push down all of these experiences that we've sadly had to experience and that now slowly bubbling up. We're starting to make sense of this. But the problem we've got, I think, in this country in particular, is this idea of how we express what mental health is or the difficulties around mental health. Now you were saying that, you know, your client was, um, you know, talking about sort of physical symptoms. And we see this across the board in the UK that whenever we have somebody who is of an older generation um, from a South Asian community, they often will present with somatic symptoms, right? That's the first thing they talk about. And I, I often wonder that there hasn't been this sort of uh, understanding or the conceptualization of what are the kind of cognitive or the emotional words because one of the things that we find within South Asian languages is there's not often the words to describe how we are psychologically emotionally feeling so there is that conceptual but if you think of the word stress stress isn't uh, from what I, I think you can you can tell me if I'm wrong but it's, it's an English word isn't it yeah Whereas if we think about our native language in Gujarati, we talk about, you know, um, kabramand. Kabramand is a physical sensation. That's something that I've heard a lot in, in yeah. my communities. Um, within other communities, they talk about heaviness of the head. You know, we don't really talk about things like depression and anxiety. Yeah. There's no direct translation. So there's something here that we need to start to bridge. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is this concept of decolonizing mental health decolonizing psychology because the frameworks that I've been taught as a, a clinical psychologist has come from a predominantly you know white European Eurocentric lens all of the studies that have been that have been done on um, you know uh, on the models that have been tested or the approaches or treatment approaches have come from white European people mm -hmm. And I think that we need to start to challenge this. We need to start to think about, hold on a minute. So if this works for white people, that's great. But does that mean it's applicable straight away to South Asian people? And is that why South Asian people aren't coming into clinics like yours and mine straight away? Where are our people going? And, you know, just these are just kind of anecdotal conversations that I've had within my family and friend circle. My family and friends are more likely to go to priests or, you know, he, other types of healing, more holistic healing. And actually, we need to be thinking about why is it that they go there first? What's that about? How do we start to integrate that knowledge? How do we start to integrate the knowledge of yoga, you know, and the knowledge of Ayurveda and all of that and start to think about the utility to help the um, community that we're trying to serve? Yeah.
Yeah. I mean, uh, spirituality is a very big, uh, it plays a huge role in Indian communities, right? Um, yeah. But I, w- I, would, I would tell my patients to come to a doctor and also go to a temple. Um, it's not a replacement, right? Like you can't, no. you can't go to a temple, go to like, a, um, like, a, like some kind of uh, faith healer. And then because it's not working out and then you're coming to me, by then probably it's too late. That's right. So, uh, you know, science and spirituality and psychology, all of this go hand in hand. I don't think yes. so they're very, very different. Yes. But they're not options. Like you have to go through the whole uh, system, you know, to get better. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Also, also, what is your idea of feminism? Because feminism has gone, can go really wrong uh, uh, sometimes where, um, so according to me, I'll tell you what feminism is, right? Feminism is not hating men, but coexisting with men, right? Wanting equal, equal privileges, opportunities, rights um, uh, to express and to just live the life they want to be, they, they want to live. But some places, what I'm saying, feminism is, uh, it's anti-men uh, revolution. <laughs> but but I, was t- I was telling my friend the other day, but um, somebody who's stigmatizing women and women's mental health are women itself. Like it can be like, for example, if you are stuck in a abusive relationship, you naturally would go to your mother because probably she's a woman, you should understand. And, um, but she's suppressing you. She's telling you that it's okay, you know what, your husband is your God, you're supposed to um, behave according to his mood because he has a lot of work pressure. So you're supposed to keep him happy and you know, satisfy him in every way possible. Um, so I think women need to educate women here to stand up for themselves is what I think because, um, you know, it's girl tribe, right? I mean, I'm a big uh, feminist in a way. When I say feminist, people are like, oh, but you're a guy. I said, no, feminist, <laughs> feminist is not, uh, being a girl, like it's it's you believing in like an equal world. What, what is your take? Like, what, what does feminism mean? Like in people that you meet? Yeah, I mean, I was very similar to you in that when I started to understand what feminism was, I mean, I came across the word a long, long time ago, and I just thought, oh well, they're just you know bra burning women that are angry at men. Um, that was my initial thought, and as I've started to really immerse myself in the ideas around feminism. It really is about this idea of, see, this is something that we, I was discussing only a few days ago with colleagues of mine, that is it equality or is it sort of this idea of living, um, oh, I've forgotten the word now, not collaboratively, but in, in kind of harmony yeah. with the other gender, you know, with men. There's something about that, isn't there? There's something about, co- that's the word, complementary. How do we complement each other? How do we sort of work in a way, live in a way that makes sense for both genders, you know? Um, And, you know, also what I'm really proud about the idea of feminism is that this isn't just about gender. This is about ableism. This is about race. This is about, you know, sexual orientation. This is across all of the boards that oppression exists and that is what we fight for that is what who we are standing up for that we live in a world which is you know uh, governed and and kind of viewed from a lens of white heteronorm you know uh, a lens and actually that's not how the world looks The world looks beautifully diverse and beautifully different. And actually, how do we hold space for every voice in the room? You know, how do we start to include, you know, conversations around caste, religion, race, whatever it is, you know, all of that has to be part of the conversation. Um, So for me, that's what it's about. And, you know, as a psychologist, I've always, always felt that, that those issues are rooted and are often the cause of mental health difficulties in communities. Why do we see such a big, you know, um, sort of range of psychological difficulties within poorer communities or in black and Asian and minority ethnic communities in the UK? Why is that? 
there's got to be something there. And this is why I feel like it's important to talk about feminism as a sort of all around challenging, you know, the, the kind of the idea of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have some observations, right, that I was thinking uh, yesterday I was making a video, compiling a video about women's mental health. And I was thinking, you know, why is it that people have to fight for equality? Isn't it supposed to be a such a basic thing? I mean, <laughs> um, why should um, why should I think like, oh, thank God I'm born as a guy. Like I can live my life. That I thought about it many times, you know. Um, uh, I'm like, oh, thank God, like I'm a guy, like I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want at any time that I want to without, you know, being worried. Why, why should I think like that? And there are days where, you know, when you scroll down the news, when there's a lot of sexual uh, abuse and molestation cases, you know, I get scared. I, I, I discuss with my family saying that I'm even scared to have a girl child. I want a girl child, but I'm scared to have a girl child because it's scary, you know, like, why should it be like this? And another observation that I had was, um, you know, when you say someone's strong, right, it's a very subjective word, right? It, it's your observation about them, right? Um, I was watching this, um, uh, I was watching this dance show yesterday, right? It's an Indian dance show. And uh, um, apparently this couple wanted a boy, but they have a girl single single girl a single child who happens to be a girl and she is apparently like making money um you know performing and taking care of her family right so everybody is telling she's not my daughter she's my son and everybody's clapping and you know being very happy i was wondering why is it that just because she's strong you equated her to being man of the house why can't she be woman and still be strong you know, these simple things, how you naturally equate, like even when you abuse, you say like, you know, some words where you refer to a female reproductive system and, and equate it to weak. Whereas you talk about like, um, like a male reproductive system is like, you know, that strength, you know, but, but it's the other way around, you know, like anatomically talking, female reproductive system is the strongest. strongest. It holds a life <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> gives birth. So these are my, some observations. I was just wondering, I was thinking, oh, what a funny world, you know, we live in. <laughs> it's true. But these are those, those small things that uphold those ideas around, you know, where women, female women status is and, and kind of, you know, men's status is that it, it was designed to hold people in a position of power. That's it. Simple. Um, and it, it works clearly. Um, but what we're also finding is that women can do all these things and, you know, and it's not about who does it better or, or anything like that. I think it's just that we, we, we need to be acknowledged that often women's voices are hidden, yeah. you know, in, 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 in anything, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated about history. I love learning about history. And when I learn about these female characters, be it in like the Mahabharat or in, you know, real Indian history, it's like, wow, why did I not know about these particular human beings that changed history? You know, we watched the, I don't know if you watched this, the, um, where this, the, the space shuttle dropped down to Mars. And it was led and, you know, kind of, re you know, all of the um, commentary was done by an Indian female space scientist. Like, she was amazing. And I was saying to my daughters, I've got two daughters, look at that. She's, she's like doing this brilliant, amazing stuff. And my, my, they were just sat there. And what was so amazing about her, she wore a bindi, she, she was talking and she was just doing it. Not even, it wasn't a thing. But for me, seeing that, I just thought how powerful, how amazing that my daughters were able to witness somebody doing such an incredible job um, being a woman. And it wasn't a white man, you know, it was great. <laughs> it was so great. But this is what we need to see. We need to stop hiding the, the, the contributions of women, you know, yeah. putting them in the shadows. 
and and it can be any women, women of color, you know, women who are disabled, whatever they are, wh whatever. We need to be bringing forward the voices that are often hidden, because the world isn't just one color, one shape, one size. It's varied and it's beautifully varied. And the more we start to see it, the more that we will accept ourselves. You know, for for us, it's so important to be able to be seen, represented in some way. I get, you know, comments all the time in my, you know, DMs of, I'm so, it's so great that a South Asian psychologist is putting herself out there. And I was like, I'm not even doing anything special. I'm just saying what I yeah. think. But, you know, to, to inspire the next generation, that is what it's about. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this because actually I want my world to look different for my children. Yeah. yeah, that's what I want. And, you know, you talking about how actually, how frightening it is to even think about having a daughter. I mean, I feel that. I feel that every time I see the news and, I mean, you know, the UK, okay, it's safer, but we still have inequality. We still do have to think twice about walking down that street at night. We do. There's no question about it. And it does, it's something that plays on every parent's mind. How are, how are we going to raise our daughters in a society where they're not seen as equal, they're not seen as, as valued? You know, that they are, dis they, ca they are seen as disposable objects. And that's not what we want, because I want my daughters to feel like they can do anything, create change in the world. Yeah. Um... I mean, that's, that's beautifully said. Um, even uh, have you ever observed the way you address, we address our parents? Um, most of the people, when it's, when you're talking to your father, there's a lot of respect, right? Sometimes you don't even call him by his name. Um, you would call him uh, daddy or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. in, 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 in local languages, you'll call with respectable uh, connection, you use it. Whereas when you're yeah. talking to your mother, you're very casual about it, which is okay. You're friendly. Um, but then I think there is somewhere like, you know, like you take your, your mother for granted compared to your father. Because at, as a kid, when you're observing, you feel like, you know, your father is going out and, you know, making money and taking care of the household and paying bills and paying for your education or getting you a bike or your first car or your first mobile. Whereas you're saying mother is cooking. I want homemakers to be represented very well uh, because, you know, people usually look down upon um, homemakers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people believe like, you know, a strong woman is the one who goes out against all the odds and uh, fights with everyone and, you know, and, you know, makes bread and butter for the family. But I feel like homemakers are the ones who's done a lot of sacrifices. Um, they are the ones who run the household. Uh, they can run a country, you know, if you if you give them a chance, because they are very smart. Uh, what are your views on it? Absolutely, I think that we we devalue yeah. the um, we devalue what women's work is, and there's been lots of writing on this uh, from a feminist angle, but from a white uh, um, kind of lens, and you know. I, I, I would love to see more writing and literature and research written from a South Asian angle because it still is a perpetuated um, sort of concept that, you know, housework women's is women's work and that's really anything, anyone can do it. And, you know, it's, it's easy. Um, I think that also the tides are changing here in the UK. We are seeing, well, Let's let I'll, I'll kind of go back a bit. So when lockdown happened, what we found was is that there was a huge um, shift back into women were doing a lot of the homeschooling, the chores, um, you know, and still trying to hold down a career. And there, that, that was across the board, you know, across all cultures and what have you. So there was a big uproar around how actually we reverted back to 1950s type, um, you know, homes. Yeah. Um, but I think that in general, there is a shift and especially within the South Asian community here in the UK and, and maybe in the diaspora as well, that men are starting to take more active roles. 
within child rearing and homemaking because they see it as a valuable thing to do. They see value in contributing to the home. And the impact that has on the children who are observing this is going to be profound. What we know about like child um, development literature and attachment literature is that, you know, that there is that idea that the mums will always be there. You know, and when I speak, when I speak to my adult clients about what was your relationships like with your parents? Oh, dad was always working. It wasn't really close to him, but mum was always, always there. And they would have this sort of relationship with mum, but she was there. There was something about being present that was quite powerful for many adults that I've worked with. And it made me think that what would happen if, if dads were present? What impact would that have? And, you know, if you think about this on a broader sense, that a society doesn't allow for dads to even be at home. Yeah. Only now are we in the UK anyway, that we're starting to see a shift of paternity leave being extended to six months for some within some companies which is amazing yeah I know it was when I started to hear about this I was like about time um and you can split the paternity leave as well so moms if they wanted to go back to work sooner they could and dads would then take that role to you know care for the baby so we're st starting to see a very short shift it's starting to happen but it's happening yeah. so I think that this is the way forward that if we have the structures in place where women can choose to go back to work if they want to and men can choose to look after the family and the children if they want to it's about choice whereas before we had no choice the dads sadly had to go out to work and i do wonder like you know if i could ask my parents or my grandparents like if you had the choice what would it have been like for you what would you have chosen to do? Because we were, we were almost given these roles. You yeah. must go out and work because you are the son. You need to provide. Um, so I really hope that in the next 50 years, I see even more change. And I cannot wait to see the impact this will have psychologically on the attachment process and also the development of children and how they then make sense of what they can and can, you know, what they can do. There's not even can't, they, what they can do and what they can achieve. Yeah. I think, I think there will be a huge shift in the attachment process for better. Um, because uh, when, um, when I see women, uh, when they bring their children with some kind of issues, like teenage, teenage daughters, teenage sons, um, they always tell that uh, my mom always uh, is behind my life. You know, she's always nagging she's always asking me to do things i said what about your father I said, my father is wonderful i said but when is your father present in the house they say whenever he's present like he comes home at like eight o'clock and eight to nine i have really good time with my father and my mom is always nagging you know then um i was wondering you know what what went wrong here and i started interviewing both the parents and mothers would be like um, i'm there in the house and um, child rearing and you know getting their homework done is my work so obviously I have to, you know, use maybe like punishment in an effective way or um, reinforcement techniques, etc. Whereas father is that, um, that, 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 that dream that comes and like, you know, makes them happy, you know, buys them, <laughs> uh, gets them some chocolates or some food home and stuff. So I tell them, why don't you play good cop, bad cop? You know, it's always that, you know, you always think one parent is very cool and another parent is very strict. That will affect your attachment process and also you know, issues. So I tell them, divide equally. Oh, it's yeah. funny that, you know, I, I was telling uh, yesterday to this couple, um, the women came with uh, postpartum depression and it's not biological, it's environmental because of the situation that she, she's stuck in, you know. Um, uh, her, her parenting techniques are being questioned and she's just six weeks, she delivered six weeks back and oh. this is her first child, she's primary gravida. Uh, and people are already, already saying that you can't feed him that. You can't, you can't do this to the baby. What did your mother teach you? Oh. If you're not even ready to be a mother, why did you even become mother? You know, this, these things are being told to her and she started crying and saying that, why is I'm figuring all of this alone by myself and even I'm working just oh. like my husband and why is this extra responsibility just on me? In this process, she's not even, um, she's regretting having a child. 
so um i to i called the husband and i i spoke to him i counseled him and i told him other than breastfeeding you're going to do everything equally with her that's the only thing you can't do the rest of the things you have to share it's not 60 40 it's 50 50 you signed up for this it's difficult do it you know because her sleep can't get disturbed because sleeplessness will worsen postpartum depression absolutely right and and get the support system that she wants if you are bringing your parents that she is not close to maybe and if they are taunting her or saying you know being passive aggressive towards her that's not going to help her mental health at all you know bring the support that she needs if you can't support mm-hmm. so this is this is everyday story this is not this one peculiar case that i see it's every single day you know in the family in the extended family in my uh, patients it's it's there all everywhere yeah absolutely yeah. it's it's so it's 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 the same thing here in the uk it's no different that we see this sort of conflict between what should and you shouldn't that it's that rigidity isn't it it's so difficult to um separate from and you think during that vulnerable time poor poor woman you know i just think oh my gosh already she's feeling physically vulnerable she's psychologically vulnerable she's trying to go through all these shifts and changes and trying to adapt into be, becoming a mother because we know that you don't just become a mother overnight it is a process it's a gradual process and it's an identity change from going to wife or you know person who didn't have this responsibility to all of a sudden now having to have all this responsibility to make sure that this human being is alive and kept alive that's a huge responsibility we forget the importance of creating and trying to keep these human beings alive that's far more important than how much money you're going to make in your job this is the next generation of human beings that could potentially be running the country yeah. you know potentially or part of that so it is a huge responsibility and yes it should be shared you know we in in the uk we talk about this idea of the village you know the village concept that it takes a village to raise a child yeah. who's in your village you know who is part of that and this is not just the early days this is now throughout until their teenagers and even even when they're adults who is part of that village to help you nurture this child and support you as a parent as well and these are the things that i think you know i wonder back to what it was like you know 50 60 years ago Uh, my parents came were born in east africa so the, uh, my grandparents were indentured to um east african countries but i i want to even generations further back you know my great grandparents what was it like for them growing up in these villages how much support systems were around and were those support systems helpful in terms of rearing and raising these children was it all left on the woman to do all this rearing because again society has changed so much that we're now living in more so in these nuclear families yeah. you know two two parents and two children or whatever it is extended families maybe around of course the in-laws and stuff but it is the pressure on the parents to do a lot of that so society has changed so as a result of these practices that we now have we have to shift accordingly you know that we need to support mothers but also support fathers as well we yeah. have to bring dads into this conversation and then think about the wider support network but okay our family may have ingrained beliefs of what parenting practices should look like that's okay i understand that because they're only taking what they've learned and they want to pass that wisdom on some of it is helpful some of it may not be helpful and that's okay but it's about then trying to surround ourselves with people who are going to be supportive and helpful too so they might not necessarily be your family but they might be friends that you 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 kind of made along the way or it might be professionals so this is about you know trying to think of the unit the family unit as a whole and not just individuals because you know i do wonder for dads what is it like when all of a sudden this sort of baby has arrived and his role has almost now been pushed out and the focus is predominantly on baby or even mother where does he fit how does his needs even you know or how are they even met um so for for dads as well there is a period of of identity change and probably even more pressure you're a father now now you must provide for two mouths or you know an extra mouth like oh gosh you know it's a lot it's a lot to to worry about 
So there's so many things we need to start to challenge. And, you know, with extension to that, this concept of toxic masculinity and how that is linked to sort of feminism and actually how feminists want to eradicate toxic masculinity. You know, these roles, these roles of what men should be, men must be strong and men must not cry and must not show their emotions. Yeah. And for many men, that's a huge problem. You know, that actually men do feel emotions. All humans feel emotions. That's normal. That's what we should be doing. We should be in becoming more in tune with our emotions because actually if we're more in tune with our emotions, we're better able to be in tune with the people around us. And then when we can do that, we can co-regulate. We can support each other. We are designed by by our biology to support each other. But because of traumas and adverse events that have happened in our lives, we bury that. We bury our emotions. We, we, we're afraid of showing that. We're afraid of showing what, what people define as emotions as weakness, but it's not. Yeah. It's actually an indicator on how to grow. Yeah. I mean, especially mental health issues are considered as weakness of a hat to flow, right? Um, um, the, this patient was telling, like, she was crying and she's like, I'm really sorry. I'm not this weak. I don't know what happened to me. I was always a strong girl. I said, but, but nothing happened. You're still the same person. You, this is this is an illness and it's going to go away. You know, there are different this, there are different ways of treatment. You know, I tell them and I tell them that, you know, even I had depression. So I think I'm strong. That's why I got it. I came out of it because you're strong. You're here seeking help. You know, it's all about your perspective is what I teach my um, uh, patients. Um, another funny observation that I saw was um, about girl education. If you're educating a girl child, it's seen as like the father is a very progressive man where I feel like it's such a basic thing. <laughs> you know, some, some, people, some, some of my friends even tell me like, oh, you, 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 you're great. You know, you, you see women and men are equal. So I'm like, it's such a, such a basic thing. You know, there's nothing special about it. It's supposed to be like that. And because I'm raised by a single parent that happens to be mother. So people think that, you know, I'm like this because of my mother, which is true, which is true. But I think everyone should be like this in spite of having single parent or like, you know, both the parents hmm. uh, functioning together. Also, um, how, when you talk about eating disorders, that's another area, right? I mean, where we see women, prevalence of eating disorders in women are definitely far more than in men. Um, what do you think, what, what can help women with eating disorders? Oh gosh, it's so that's massive area, isn't it? It's not an area yeah. of expertise. I will say, I'll put it out there, disclaimer. Yeah. Um, eating disorders to me is a, it's a, it's it's kind of like a consequential problem that we are faced with, simply because of the fact that, you know, I, I mean, the way that I see it, it's all to do with control, isn't it? Yeah. You know that. I can control what I take in or what I don't take in, what I eat, what I don't eat. And, and you're, we're constantly being bombarded with images of women who are slim and look like this. And, you know, it, it constantly makes us feel like we're not enough. Yeah. And for us to gain some level of control in a chaotic world that we often do find ourselves in, that's one way of achieving that. You know, one way of controlling and, you know, our society, it, it, it sort of praises thinness. It praises that sort of aesthetic to be thin. You know, it praises women who look that particular way and chastises women that, that don't. And it's such a problem in, in our society, in our communities. And I don't think it's it's only you know limited to women. I know that men also experience it because again, social media, images we're constantly seeing, Bollywood films, you know, when you look, even when you look at Bollywood films and how the bodies have changed, it's huge, isn't it? Like yeah. I, I grew up in I was born in the eighties, so I grew up watching films in the eighties. I watched some of the earlier films in the seventies and sixties. And bodies looked so different then. Yeah. And now, fast forward to 2020, everybody is super slim with six packs and, 
you know, it, that that was that's all you see, and you just think, is that really achievable for for somebody who, who's me lives a normal life? And the reality is no. But if you're constantly bombarded with these images, if you want to be desirable, you need to dress this way, look this way. Um, it's difficult to unsee that, and I think that girls who um, see this type of stuff are, are only trying to fit in, are only trying to get some sort of status or recognition or pave their way. And when we have a society that tells us that, well, you're only valuable because of the way you look, you're only going to be valuable if you are slim or, you know, that, and that's, that's all we see you as. We're not bothered about what's happened, what's in here and what's in your heart. Of course, we're going to want to be, you know, a size zero or whatever, because we want to become famous. We want to become valued. And that's yeah. our way of controlling that and making that happen. Yeah. yeah, I think validation is what, especially a certain age group, is constantly seeking. Yeah. Um, um, I, think, I think one solution for this would be like, people like you and me, like who are interested in um, educating people should be called for maybe these schools and uh, where there are different NGOs where we can educate other people to educate more because you and me can't yes. cover a lot of areas, right? Like we, we can't yeah. cover, it's not possible geographically. Also. No. Yeah, we can train some people where they can go and uh, uh, help uh, younger women to deal with their emotions effectively. Um, mm -hmm. Because you, you rightly said it is about control. Uh, when I asked this particular uh, one of my patients, um, I think last week, um, why is uh, why why are you doing this ritual of eating and you know purging? She says that nothing else in my life is in, nothing else in my life is in my control. So only this is in my control. So at least you know, you know, I'm thriving by doing this. At least, you know, um, there are always environmental causes. Um, so for people who are watching, I want why we are doing this talk is for you to understand that yes, mental health conditions can be genetic you know there are some risk factors that are not modifiable you can't do anything about it but by and large it is also hugely environmental and when i talk about environment yes men and women both are environmental factors but women seem to be having a lot more environmental risk factors than men some are created by their own gender or some are created by opposite gender it doesn't matter i think most of these belief systems are force fed um, by our previous generations you know um, I think you have to break out of it, you know, gender defined roles and gender defined behavior, gender defined goals. Um, uh, aren't you too ambitious for a girl is what I heard someone say it. Um, so I told I told this man, why are you treating your wife like that? Isn't she supposed to be goddess of your house? He very sarcastically told me, yes, that's why I want her to stay home. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I said, yeah, she is the goddess. That's why I want her to stay in the room. There's, there's a lot here, though, because when I was reading about the literature um, into partition and what happened, because, again, we're still learning about that because a lot of that history was erased, how in that time, in particular, how women were all holding the honour of the family, you know, the ears that we talk about, don't we? And how if a woman was taken or raped or, or whatever, there was that huge discretion, the destruction of the man's and the family's honor. Um, so I think about how that has traumatized many of these families who've, hold, who've held on to these narratives around, you know, how women do hold these of the family and how just like your client's husband said, well, I'm going to keep her at home because I need to protect her or whatever it is that he's trying to do. But these are ingrained beliefs because they come from a place which happened many, many years ago. There's no threat anymore. You know, the threat has gone, I hope, in many ways. We have to start to empower and encourage our, our, our women. You know, without that, we will constantly live in fear. We don't need to live in fear anymore. Let's, let's, educate and build a society where we support each other you know that if he empowers his wife to be whatever she wants to be what how is that going to affect the world the system around, how is he going to benefit from that he clearly is going to benefit from that yeah uh, also i think selflessness as a virtue mm. is force fed into like 
is equated with like women's gender right oh yeah. I, i'm like oh, you know get out of selflessness you know practice self love and self love doesn't equate selfish <laughs> <laughs> even <sighs> even how you portray mother's love as you know she's always going to keep her child i tell all the mothers please place yourself first then your child what kind of example are you setting for your child yeah if if you're not going to take care of yourself and if you're only going to like uh take care of your child how, what is it going to look like you know I, i when people say oh she's selfless i find her very stupid to be very honest i i tell them i like, know forget about being selfless you know practice self love because self love i feel like it will heal lot of mental health conditions and physical health conditions also yes they go hand in hand don't they of yeah. course they do and i think that there's this sort of like the selflessness is it's like you wear it with a badge of honor oh i'm a mother and i'll do anything for my kids yes okay yeah. in in some ways i understand that and that it is it's this sort of romanticized belief that we should be like that but in reality if i'm you know on the floor on my last breath how can i be a good mother to you yeah, you know yeah. if i'm if i'm struggling with my physical body how can i be a good wife how can i be a good daughter i can't yeah. i can't be there for you because i'm not taking care of myself and i think this is something that we all struggle with in many ways of almost allowing ourselves to take care of ourselves there is this belief that but you're going to take care of me but you're going to take care of me it doesn't matter if i you know burn myself to the ground you'll take care of me and that i think is the huge problem that we're expecting someone else to do it for us yeah. when in fact we can only control what we take in how we treat our bodies Yes people around us will be able to push our wheelchair should they need to but they're not going to be the ones that are going to be helping us to strengthen our legs or whatever it is that we need to do to in order to stay fit and healthy. I think that I see this cycle of I'm going to burn myself, I'm going to just be this martyr as a mother and then when my time comes my children or whoever will take care of me. And yeah. that's that's the wrong way. and this is where we see a huge difference within cultures that the collectivist culture has this idea that well they'll take care of me they'll take care of all of that and i think that that's fine in many ways but also at the same time why don't you live your life to your full potential why not live your like you said your 48 year old or 42 year old um female patient who came in live your life to your full potential you won't look back and think oh if only i did that and if only i expected them to have done that for me no yeah. that's not yeah. how we find happiness in our life we find happiness in our life through the things that we create we go out and make happen and it could be that you grow some beautiful plants in your garden it could be that you i don't know start writing but it's your growth your yeah. growth that you see joy in we have been fed this idea that joy and happiness comes from external things it doesn't it comes from within it comes from seeing our development and growth learning to play an instrument learning a new skill that's where we see joy not from going out and earning money or expecting others to take care of us that's not joy that's not growth yeah at any age you know at absolutely any, yeah. yeah yeah you know i i ask all my um, perimenopausal um, like patients that why don't you go you know what's your hobby they're like oh i'm nothing you know my whole life went by just taking care of my kids and my husband and my in-laws i said well now is the time now that you know everybody is like on their own way why don't you do something they're like oh at this age what do i what will i learn I'm like oh life expectancy is much more than what you think it is you're just 45 or 50 so I tell them like if you want to learn dance you can still go and dance some of them look at me like you know I'm this young uh, doctor who is talking <laughs> <to me. laughs> about they're thinking we need to swap places <laughs> <laughs> we need to get done and chucked out checked out don't we <laughs> but yeah it's true though you're right that Yeah. you know they they because again it it comes from what we have seen you know 
What do we see our mothers and grandmothers doing? I think only just a, uh, 20, 30 minutes ago, I saw on an Instagram post that I think she looked like she was in her 60s or 70s. Um, a lady, South Asian lady, had started her own business in something. And I was like, that's amazing. How great is that? You know, and I yeah. love seeing these grandmas who are, you know, comedians, obviously, you know, part of um, Instagram acts and influencers, but they, 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 they're part of that. They're, they're showing their, their authenticity and their, their funniness and, and their value because we seem to pigeonhole our older generation as well. They're not going to provide any value to us. Yeah. And that's a big problem because they have so much value. They've got yeah. so much wisdom. They just yeah. stop sharing it because they, they then just park themselves to one corner of the room and expect everyone to take care of them when in fact they've got so much to give, so much to offer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I'll give you an example of my mother, right? I mean, I, for the longest part of my life, I didn't even know she was a sportswoman. You know, she's a homemaker and, you know, she looks a certain way. And I thought she's very docile and very naive, all of that. And uh, someday I was just uh, looking for some certificates of uh, my school certificates and a, a huge suitcase of certificates just dropped down. I'm like, oh, what are these? Then I'm seeing her name with obviously a different initial, like surname. I'm seeing her name and she has these trophies and certificates. Uh, she represented, uh, you know, she went for interstate competitions and inter-district competitions. She won winner or runners-up. I said, what? Who is this person? You know, and she's shying away from it. And she's like, no, that is just before marriage. I'm like, oh, what changed after marriage? Did you have a head injury? Aren't you the same person? <laughs> Isn't that interesting that, yeah. you know, there's that huge change pre and post marriage that we have to let go of identities but actually that part of your mom still is there yeah. you know yeah. she still is that athlete inside of her she's just had to suppress it and yeah. this is what i see that all these women that become mothers or, or whatever they do in their life they have so much to offer yeah. so much and it makes me really sad that they have to let that go you know, I, I just wonder, like, I wonder, my mom tells, used to tell me how my grandma used to crochet and this and that. And I was like, if only she taught me, like, I'd be quite good at crocheting or something, <laughs> you know. The yeah. wisdom that these women have, it, it just isn't, you know, it's never really celebrated. And, you know, something like that, your mom being an athlete is like, how oh, amazing, yeah. you know, how amazing is that? Yeah. On that, on that amazing note, I think we should end because it'll get cut otherwise. Thank you so much, Tina. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you for having me. It didn't feel like me. first time. It felt like we are friends. No, yeah. absolutely. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. And cheers. Cheers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take care then, everyone. You have a good day and happy Women's Day again. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Much. Bye. Take care. Bye.